Our New Testament reading and preaching text can be found in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. For those of you that are with us live in the sanctuary, that can be found in the Pew Bible on New Testament page one, uh, 119. So I'll tell you a little secret about pastors, okay? One of the things that we regularly hear from our congregation is when we have somebody who's coming up here and reading for us, they're like, don't give me one of those passages with all those long Old Testament names, you know? So today you will be very pleased. I did not give Evelyn that many names, gave you a couple. I've got way more. So I, I, you know, I made it worse for me. And if you pay attention, you'll for sure hear me mispronounce things. But, you know, after 15 or 20 readings of this this week, I can only do it so well. So anyway, we are in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Livia belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter Standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was supposed, spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to dark, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. So in the chapter right before this, Jesus does the unthinkable. After his resurrection, an event that nobody saw coming, Jesus begins to talk about his leaving. And this is another one of those instances when the early church was just like, what? That makes absolutely no sense. But there is a difference between how the kingdom of God works and how all other things work, and those things are at odds. Why would Jesus do this? How could he do this? Doesn't he realize this is the perfect time? for his kingdom to be fully established. He is leaving the world in a lurch. But as usual, Jesus' return to his father furthers his kingdom, but not in the way we would have done it. 
We are at the beginning of a several week study going through different stories in the book of Acts. And some of you today are like, you know, Mark must be really confused. He is preaching a sermon on a text that we preach on a different day. That's the Pentecost sermon, and it's supposed to happen on Pentecost, and he's supposed to be wearing red stole. This is all wrong. And in many ways, you are correct, but I hope that you will see today that today's text sets up everything else that's going to happen in the book of Acts. If I had left this out, it would be hard to pull all the pieces of this book together. I want to talk about the book itself for just a moment. Um, Traditionally, this book is known as the Acts of the Apostles, but as the study website, the Bible Project, and other resources make clear, that name just doesn't express what is going on in this book. Oh sure, there are apostles doing things all through this book, but no one of them makes it through the entire book. Some start at the beginning and kind of fall out as we move through. Others come up later, and still few of them make it to the end of the book. A more fitting title for this book might be The Acts of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Because the work of Jesus and the Spirit is pushing forward the work of a new church all throughout this account. That's the uniting feature in this book. And as I said in chapter 1, just before what we read, Jesus did what none of them imagined. Just as the church is getting off the ground, he leaves to return to the Father. And I want us to kind of tap in to what that must have felt like. How did the people feel when that happened? You know, it wasn't all that long ago when they thought they lost Jesus to the crucifixion. What did this feel like to them? I bet it felt like another loss, don't you? I bet it might have even felt worse than the first one because they even understand this one less than they did that one. In our section of scripture, the new church is celebrating one of the holy days of Judaism, the feast of the Pentecost or weeks. The celebration is at the end of the spring harvest. It's the time of birthing where farm animals were being born. And it is a hopeful time where you celebrate what's to come. So all of the church, all of the Jews were together at this time. And then all of a sudden, something very strange, unexpected happened. If you are like most people, you're not involved with churches where this type of an event happens on a regular basis. So uh, most of us, if we're honest, this kind of thing makes us little, a little nervous. Do we have uncomfortable people in the crowd today? I think we probably do. You are not alone because not only did it make others of us uncomfortable, it made them uncomfortable too. But something else was going on. Something else that they would have been, you know, this is kind of like that. You know, do you have things that you experience that remind you of other things? Have you had experiences in life that show you something else that's going on? When I was thinking about who in our congregation would connect with that understanding, I I thought of our veterans. You know, I bet every year, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, the anniversary of D-Day, many of our veterans kind of relive uh, their service and what they experienced during that, and many more of us uh, relive it through stories we've been tell, been told some of our parents served. Um, you know, we engage with it like that. And I, as I was preparing this week, I remembered the father of a dear former pastor of my family's. Um, this is a guy that I only got to know through stories. He was gone before I got to know his son, but he was an army ranger officer. Uh, that led a campaign that liberated a small little French city just days after D-Day. And when his son, my friend, visited that small little uh, French village years later, they celebrated him as if he was 
the one who'd liberated him. They made the biggest deal. The mayor told stories of what it was like on that day and how they have the son of their liberator. They made it just this big deal. So even though they're having this other experience, it is reminding them of a former experience. And here, as the actions of the Holy Spirit come over these people with fire, it reminds them of other experiences that their people has had. The dedication of the tent of meeting in the wilderness, when the glory of the Lord filled the tent and no one could enter. The dedication of the temple of the Lord under King Solomon, when the temple was filled with God's glory and also no one could enter. You know, maybe even Moses and the experience of the burning bush fit in here as well. And as this fledgling church community continues to mourn the physical loss of Jesus, they are also mourning what they're going through at the time. See, it hasn't been easy for them lately. Maybe never, but it's gotten especially difficult now. They've been ostracized by their people. They've been put out of the temple and the only society they've ever known. But God is revealing a new thing. God is demonstrating to this band of outcasts that now the temple where they believe God's presence resides is no longer a building, but a people. See, God's presence will no longer be associated with the structure. God's new temple is the people he inhabits. Think of how radical a change this would have been for this group that they always understood God in relation to a building, in relation to a place. Um, I think we can identify with that. We love our church building. This is at least the third different building that our church has occupied since they started gathering in 1860 and formally became a church in 1867. God has used all of these places powerfully in the history of the church. And my guess is, if we had a detailed picture of each church, this one now would be the most beautiful one. It has all this beautiful, intricate work. It's got all this space that we've benefited from. We love it and we use it as a tool that we need to work. But you know what? The treasure isn't the building. The treasure of this church are the temples that God inhabits. In this building and those that are part of the church on TV and the internet, you and me, those are the the new temples that God is coming into. And the treasure is the lives that Jesus guides, everyone that responds to follow Jesus' invitation to be part of his church. The treasure is the people who respond to the work of the Holy Spirit in them and around them. That is the treasure in this and every church in the world, in the day we're reading about, in our day and in the future. But as the Holy Spirit rolls out this new plan for his people, he makes something clear that Israel always struggled with. He makes it clear that his plan for humanity always was an ethnically diverse multi-ethnic community. That God's plan was not for one people group or one person. God's plan was for the whole earth. Now, in their day, language was a barrier. It is in our day, too. But it was much more of a barrier in their day. Um, Places as close as Orlando or even High Springs to Gainesville likely spoke completely different languages back in this day. And what the Holy Spirit is doing is he's showing them that this new temple, the people that, will be, that he inhabits, will never be an ethnically central group. They know these guys aren't part of their tribe, but they hear the message in their own tongue. God has never limited himself to working with one kingdom or culture, and he is not going to start now. In fact, Now is the time he's going to expand his work. He's going to double down right before their very eyes. There are so many ways that we can live this out. I wrote just a few, but I hope you're not limited by my ideas or my suggestions. I hope that you really say, God, Holy Spirit, how are you empowering me 
to live these things out too. But I'm going to throw out just a few suggestions. First of all, recognize that we ourselves and all the children of God are the new temple. We and those around us are special recipients of God's presence. When we do the work of the gospel, we display the power of God in and to the world around us. When we look countercultural, when we welcome others, when we care about the least of these, when we forgive others, we display the kingdom of God to the world. God has given us so much. God has forgiven us so much. Can we extend that to the rest of the world? Also, we ask ourselves, how do we continue to pursue ethnically diverse expressions of our faith? Well, one of the easy ways is we continue to support foreign missions. We listen to the support and report of our missionaries. I don't know if you are aware of this, but often a complaint that churches have about missionaries is they send them off to live in some other culture in a foreign country, and when they come back, they're different. And maybe they were a good speaker when they left, and they come back, and they just don't connect anymore. And we consider that a negative. And actually, that's not a negative at all. What has happened in most of these cases is they've learned how to connect with another culture. They've learned how to connect with another people group. And so it makes sense when they come back to ours that it's not their primary anymore. Um, a lot of missionaries talk about this, about being a people that has no home because, you know, they're not fully accepted where they go, and then when they come back, they're not fully accepted any, either. But instead of making that a negative, why don't we celebrate that? And why don't we listen to them more and say, t explain to us what we should understand about what you're hearing, what you're experiencing, what you're living through. Also, this can extend uh, a lot less far away right around us in how we think of local missions. I hope that we don't only think of supporting local missions through our church. I hope we also do this individually. There are several different local missions that our church is connected to. Check them out, support their work, be changed by their experience, and don't just support them through the church. Consider supporting them individually too. And I think another possible powerful possibility is to read a book that will stretch you to understand a viewpoint of a culture that is beyond your experience. You know, some of the hardest things we can do is try to open ourselves to other experiences, especially when they're very, very distinct from what our experience is. Um, I would love to process with any and all of you um, any of those books that um, you might be uh, helped by in this area. If you need to touch base with me, do not hesitate um, to touch base with me and we figure out what's gonna fit for you, what's gonna be helpful for you. These things, like I said, they can be challenging because they're so different than what we've experienced, but they can be like life altering in all of the right ways. We need to hear the moving of the Spirit, the way the church has heard it throughout eternity. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are inhabited by the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And God is calling all peoples to himself. This is something, this is not a new thing. This is something God has always been a part of. It's for us to live into that calling in ways that bring glory to God and have these experiences that change us in powerful and helpful ways. As Fred said, Become part of a community that seeks to glorify God, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, and meet human needs. Join us at First Presbyterian Sundays at 8.30 and 10.55 or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9. We welcome you. Come and 